take audience questions? Uh, there's a hand on there. Yeah, I, I can see. Uh, there's a lot of hands. Hmm. Hi. Um, first, thank you to Google for having the problems that caused Go to be born. And thank you for suffering through them. Um, can you tell a story from using Go in production that taught you something that got fixed, like a, a really gnarly bug that resulted in a really interesting fix? It's, you don't have to name names, because I know you're not allowed to. It doesn't have to just be us. You guys can also answer. <laughs> <laughs> so my, well, it's not really a bug, but it's something that comes up common in testing. When I'm printing out uh, an expected and a wanted value, um, or I'm sorry, an expected and, and the value that I got, and I'm trying to compare two byte slices via reflect.equal, and it always returns false, but the byte slices are always empty. Uh, or, no, not empty. Yeah, one's I do nil, one's empty. Yeah, yeah, one's nil and one's empty, and it always, they look like they're the exact same thing, and I sit there and just bang my head on the table for about an hour until I remember that one of them could actually be nil. It's like that's something that comes up, but it's not that nasty. I don't know. There, there's something similar. It's uh, when I teach the Go tour, there's uh -huh. one exercise where people basically iterate and then change pixels, pixels in an image. And a lot of people write something like 4i, pixel in range. And they try to modify pixel, and pixel is actually a copy of the original value, so they're basically modifying a, a, just a copy, so it doesn't have any set effect. And that, that's a compiler error. And that was, I was really surprised with that. It's like, oh, okay. If, even if you're using it, if you're not reading from the variable, it's still an error. And most of the time, if that's doing it, it's because the, your code is wrong somehow. So, so I mentioned the, the three index slice thing in my talk. That was actually, I actually ran into that problem in production with them. Um, corrupting memory because one caller was just using a pen thinking it was safe and it was crapping on somebody else's memory that I had given out to another Go routine. And so then I started just doing, using reflect slice header and unsafe and modifying the capacity of the slice directly. And then I just started kind of copy pasting that around and then Rob I think got angry that you know, I was using unsafe and stuff and I was like, hey, you know, capacity is the fundamental part of the language you know, and we can't, we can't modify it. And, it, it comes up very, very rarely, but um, I think Rob and Russ finally agreed that it is a little <coughs> weird that we expose like the cap built in and we let you modify all the other parts of the slice, but there was this one part of the slice that was magic and it was like kind of read only. So, um. Yeah, pro probably the gnarliest things I've seen are, you know, in some of the really large servers, the Go servers at Google, with like really big heaps exposing strange bugs in the garbage collector and stuff but it's kind of like beyond my ability to even really understand what was going on at that point. Um, you know, like Ross and co would get involved and just be like, oh yeah, it's that thing. And then, you know. Yeah, so it, on, on Juju, which is pretty, a pretty big um, project, like we have a lot of people writing a lot of code and it, it seems that we've, we've managed to like, use every possible permutation of the syntax that is valid. Um, and that made Juju quite a useful test case for finding Compiler bugs. It's, we found like two escape analysis bugs, um, which which was, was really good because we had this through just fate. We had this bit of code which would exercise a bug, which even the standard library test didn't. So you know we were able to turn that into and get the bug fixed before you would have to have that as a um, as a, you know a, a bug fix would have to go out to a point release. So yeah, like, I, I was always really pleased that Juju is this. It's so large that it can generate its own set of bugs in the in standard library. I hope that's not your like sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Quality is quantity. There's also different kind of bugs which I've seen sometimes that they're really difficult to find. I thought they were really difficult to find, which is basically when you have data races, and then I discovered that you can do go build dash race, and then it just panics and it shows you exactly where. So that's, that's a very good way of finding bugs. Wish we had that for the network. Sorry? Yeah. My races between processes over the network. Yeah. That'd be nice. That's, that a, be. that's a billion dollar business right there. <laughs> um, another question from the audience? Is a uh, heap compaction on the garbage collection roadmap or would that be considered a um, version 2.0 breaking change with Seago and so on and so forth? No, I think it is on the roadmap. There's, there's questions about interop with C, whether you introduce some sort of JNI like pinning mechanism, but uh, I don't think anyone wants to do that. So they've been tightening the rules for what's allowed when what sorts of pointers and values you can pass between uh, C and Go. 
And actually, I think in Go 1.4, it includes tightening language around telling you what we promise will keep working in the future. Um, it's all around that we are allowed to recursively kind of copy a data structure and like send it back, but you can't have some background C thing that's manipulating memory that's owned by Go. Um, but yeah, so I, I think there are plans for a compacting collector. You'll have to follow some new rules, but the new rules will come like two releases ahead of that. Um, I have a question. It's, so if you take the languages like C++ or Java, which are widely used in the industry, but also older than Go, they are always trying to get new things in their languages. Whereas something that struck me today is that Go seems to be pretty self-contained and I wonder if it's, I mean, there is no, there, I don't see any sign of willing to expand the language for now. Is it a kind of minimalistic approach? I mean, small is beautiful, or uh, do, you expect, do you think that maybe the language is not mature enough to uh, feel the need of expanding, expanding it? Um, so, w when I first saw the, like the, the first video in 2009, like that, the, 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 there's a slide when Rob says, um, so why can't we fix this problem by just adding another library? And his, his, his point is that you, you just can't fix it by you know, adding another layer on top. You have to go back to, go back to the start, and that, that means a new language, not just a new kind of version of Boost or some other kind of library. And it was those ideas of minimalism that like, really were attractive to me. Um, and I, I, I see the, the fact that Go is basically unchanged. I mean, Rob said uh, in response to a comment, you know, the language is done. It's up to you guys to use it now. Um, Well, there's a, there's a famous, you know, quote from Rob where he's saying that, you know, the language was designed by consensus between him and Robert Griesmer and Ken Thompson. And, you know, no feature of the language would be included until all three of them agreed that it was actually necessary and the right thing to do. And, you know, there were some things like slices, you know, it actually took them like more than a year to kind of arrive at the, what the design is for slices. And the Go team has only expanded since then and achieving consensus um, becomes exponentially more difficult the more people you add. <laughs> and so, um, I just, I don't see, like, there are lots of small things that people sort of want and a few really big things. Um, but, like, a lot of the small things, they kind of don't cause enough pain, like the absence doesn't cause enough pain that it's really worth including them at this point. And the things that are really big are just too fundamentally challenging to the rest of the whole language because like a huge part of, of what makes Go what it is is the orthogonality of the features that exist right now and that kind of there's a sort of delicate balance that's been struck um, and so yeah I feel like you know Go, Go 1.x is, is kind of in its done state um, and really you know it's just all about building the stuff around it that will make it you know really successful. I don't think like adding generics will suddenly satisfy everyone. Like, does anybody actually believe that if we added generics to go right now, it would make all the people who are asking for generics happy? Of course not, because it wouldn't be the right kind of generics. It would be different to what they were expecting or not allow them to do whatever it was in exactly the way that they'd imagined. Well, you would also need union types and pattern matching and inheritance and, yeah, yeah. You know, like, everyone has yeah. the next thing that they need. Yeah until it's C++. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not a joke. You know, that's exactly how it happened. And, I mean, know, sta standards committees never remove anything. You're not going to see, like, 20 features removed from C++ 20 or whatever, you know? It's, they're only going to be adding new things every year. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Bjarne would be the first to admit that that's the case. You know, he, he acknowledges that that's, you know, and it's been successful for them. But if you want C++, you know, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Or Rust. I mean, Rust might be a yeah. good compromise. Like, yeah. Rust has a good type system, and they have you know trees of cancelable you know fibers or whatever they call them, go routines. And, and most and most impressively, like lately, a lot of their development has been cutting things out of the core yeah. of the language. Like yeah. compared to how complex Rust was six months ago, a year ago, like it's actually looking quite simple nowadays. So, um, I think their compile times are still ridiculously slow, but you know that can only get better. I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, 
It's easy for a small startup with few people to start with a new technology like Go, but for a large company, it's very difficult to bootstrap and move to, to new things. So going back to scale, and since you work for a very large company, maybe you could share some advices to people who try to evangelize it in larger companies and also some challenges or problems and how you go about this. Thanks. Hire an agile consultant, it does go. Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. what, um, well, what, what the Alan, who runs the Melbourne uh, Go user group, um, and in fact what we see from a lot of the user groups is Go kind of comes into organisations uh, not as, okay, great, this is 2014, we're going to choose the new language for our new product. It comes in as a solution, and in Alan's case, he'd written some kind of log processing job that was taking more than a day to handle a day's worth of logs. So he you know, had an opportunity to try Go, saw that, and you know, he proved itself in that particular use case. Um, and that is really evangelism at its core. Like, this solved a problem for me. I want to tell you about this. Or you could do what John did at Cloudflare and just sneak it in. Yeah. Just implement something in Go and don't tell anyone until it's done. That's what I did at Atlassian. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people tell the same story, you know. There was a problem to be solved. They solved the problem. He went, oh, that's good. And they said, yeah, I did it in Go. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean where, if, where I see a lot of, a lot of the, the kind of momentum of Go is um, in, in a space that was just kind of abandoned, command line applications. I mean, nobody does those in, in Java. Like they're, just, they're too slow to start up a whole JVM just to do LS and then close it all again, and C -sharp, C Sharp is not even more of a, an option there. But like Go has provided a renaissance of command line applications. Uh, Cloud Foundry, I mean, I don't know about Heroku, but Cloud Foundry, they, their CLI application was based in Ruby, and almost all of their support case for that was for helping people get their Ruby environment run, just so that they could type the, run their Cloud Foundry. It was exactly CLI. the same in Heroku. Yeah, and Go has just completely made, made that problem go away. Cross-compiling support. You um, you can now just ship customers this one binary. Um, think think of other examples. Like we even have uh, there's a there's a web service that you just give it your GitHub URL and it will do the cross-compiling for you. Um, so th there are, there are niches which which go which go into which I think people probably didn't even imagine. It's probably also if you're trying to evangelize Go in a large organization, it's probably also worth you know, just pointing out the number of really, really big companies that are now using Go. Like, obviously, there's Google, but now there's like, people like Apple and Comcast and Facebook and, you know, just there's a list on the Go wiki of, of uh, people who use Go and the, the articles that they've written describing how they use Go. And so, you know, you just pick a few of those and maybe, you know, some of the ones that you think that you're um, C CTO admires, maybe, and take it to them and say, look, you know, they're using it. It's great. But if, if you're talking about evangelism at kind of that, that size, it's not really about Go the language or Rust the language or next version of Java. Like, they are kind of interchangeable. You're talking about bigger ideas of we, you know, what does it mean to... We, suddenly, we had a company full of Python programmers and we want to now become a polyglot company. I um, mean, Peter, Peter's talk at, at, at GoForCon earlier this year was really good about how you you have you, you, you build a company that can have multiple you know you are not just wedded to one language and those are kind of I think more of the, the deep rooted parts of introducing a new language is that you need to solve the tooling problem you need to uh, make sure that your operations people are happy with a new way of deploying like all of, they used to be really good at deploying Tomcat war files and now you're like oh yeah just SCP the binary it's fine um, and I, I think those are the like, like techn technology is cool, but the, you need to look at the organizational problems of, you know, you, of changing from something old and known to something new and unknown and looking at their fears. And also, I think just, you know, try and get your colleagues excited. Like, don't try and take it up the chain straight away if you feel that there's some, like, resistance there. If you can get, like, a groundswell of support from the people that you work with, you know, show them stuff you've been working on in your spare time or, you know, I don't know, point them towards some of the videos from people today and stuff like that, um, you know, People tend to listen to their employees, well, sometimes, and, and, that, and that can really help. But uh, I think we have to leave it there. Um, Sylvain's wildly gesticulating at me from off the stage. Um, so, yeah.
Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.